animals crowd the pages of children's books, where they appear in many different shapes and forms. They can be uh, beloved pets. They can be dangerous wild animals lurking in the forest or funny, even uncanny mirror images of our human selves. Dressed in human clothing and walking upright on two legs. More often than not, they think, speak and act in a human fashion and they are ascribed human emotions and abilities to reason. And this latter kind of animal character is what we are going to talk about today. According to Oxford English Dictionary, anthropomorphism, which is a horribly difficult word to pronounce by the way, so uh, excuse me already um, if I uh, get my tongue entangled in saying it. Anthropomorphism is the attribution of human personality or characteristics to something non-human, can be an animal or an object. Now, during this lecture, I will use both anthropomorphic and humanized animals, just because humanized is more easier uh, to say, actually. As a matter of fact, uh, psychologists tell us that humans are natural anthropomorphizers. It is part of our mental equipment. Our anthropomorphizing tendencies is a result of our ability to have what cognitive scientists call a theory of mind. Um, that is an ability to imagine what others think and feel. When anthropomorphizing, we simply extend our theory of mind to members of another species. But while this is a very useful ability that helps us better understand other human beings, it helps us with human interaction, it can and often do lead to a problem that we project our mentality onto other species such as animals. Our interpretation of their behavior often being wrong. And there is an ethical implication here that we will get to later in the lecture as well. So with this in mind, it's hardly surprising that we humans have a very long tradition of telling stories about humanized animals, if we are these natural anthropomorphizers. But why have these human animal characters come to be such an inherent part of specifically children's fiction? Are animals and children somehow especially connected? It seems so. If we look back in time, anthropomorphic animals have been part of Western children's literature from the very beginning. However, not necessarily because they were part of stories that were originally created with children in mind. Aesop's animal fables uh, and fairy tales um, were not originally created with children in mind. But um, Um, these kinds of stories where humanized animals occur were around, around long before we had a literature that was specifically targeted to children. But early on, influential philosophers and educators, such as John Locke, recommended, for example, Aesop's fable as appropriate reading for children. And so it happened that also fairy tales eventually became considered especially child-minded or for children specifically, much thanks to uh, Bruno Bettelheim, um, who, um, whose famous defense of fairy tales uh, he based on uh, psychoanalytic theories. 
Although one has to admit that when it comes to the suitability of fairy tales, um, it's also a category of stories that keeps being uh, debated whether they are suitable in fact for children or not. But in short, animal fables and fairy tales uh, became an important part of our earliest Western children's literature. And they were imagined to speak simultaneously to the child's fancy, as well as they at the same time taught children important life lessons. In early Christian didactic children's literature from around the 18th and 19th centuries, the child and the animal continued to be interconnected. Now here the manner in which child characters treated animals were seen to reveal their sense of morality and their ability to be compassionate. The bad child was cruel to animals and often punished for it, whereas the good child showed kindness to animals and was often duly rewarded. So with these examples, um, I love, wanted to show that from the very beginning, children and animals have been intertwined in Western imagination. And as a result, in the stories told about and for children. Already Aristotle, in his History of Animals, claims that psychologically, a child hardly differs for the time being from an animal. Psychologists such as Freud, Piaget and Bettelheim have kept reinforcing the myth of a universal and essential bond between child and animal. As a result, both animals and children have come to be regarded as liminal categories in need of socializing and taming. Because in order to uphold the myth of the civilized and rational adult, we need the myth of the uncivilized, irrational, and animal-like child. In the 20th century, many classic anthropomorphic characters were immortalized in children's books that we still read and revere today. This is the case with, uh, for example, Beatrix Potter's Peter Rabbit, Jean de Brunhoff's Babar books, or Disney's animal characters. This was also the time when new printing technologies made attractive color illustration possible. And it was also the time when animation and film, visual media, became part of popular culture. So I think it's an important point to remember that these anthropomorphic animal characters, they were not just built by words. They came to life in vivid and colorful images and illustrations, which without doubt contributed to their long lived success. Now, oops, if the child and the animal go together in children's books. So does humanized animals and illustration. And as you will notice, most of my examples that I will use and show here during my lecture, they come from illustrated children's books or picture books. Um, because I do believe that the visual side or the visual implications of the anthropomorphic animal are great and also an explanation to their uh, success. Today humanized animals are still an inevitable part of the stories that we tell for children. They may even be considered one of the characteristics that set children's business off from what I call, for lack of a better word, adult literature. A humanized animal 
or a human animal, often serves the purpose of holding up a mirror to ourselves. This distorting mirror has a karmic ability or aptitude, which anthropomorphic animals, which make anthropomorphic animals fitting characters in comedy, caricature, satire, and entertainment. Animals are good for, animals are simply good for saying things about humans. But the tone doesn't always have to be humorous and lighthearted. Let me show you some examples of the opposite. In John Marston and Sean Tan's uh, picture book, The Rabbits from 1998, um, Marston and Tan tell the history of Australia using animal imagery. The British colonizer are cast as rabbits, an invasive animal species that the European colonialists brought with them to Australia, where they, having no natural enemies, had a devastating impact on Australian ecology. Casting the colonizers as rabbits is a powerful symbol of human power abuse. The invaders enslave the indigenous peoples, they exploit the natural resources and bring with them industrialization that ravishes the land. Rabbits, 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 millions and millions of rabbits everywhere we look, there are rabbits. Their motto is might is right and they are literally everywhere. Another intriguing example is Swedish picture book artist Anna Höglund's uh, picture book Om detta talar man endast med kaniner. I, um, there is no good way to translate this title, so I'll leave it to others. It is a picture book with a um, um, teenage protagonist, uh, also geared towards an older age range, about a highly sensitive teenager cast as a rabbit who finds it hard to fit in, communicate with peers and exist in the modern world. The protagonist's rabbit nature corresponds perfectly with the psychological sensitivity he or she experiences. And in a poetic manner, this book tells the story of an introvert who has to find his or her own path in life. Um, it's also a, a picture book that I've noticed is very popular to use with um, young adults or um, students, actually. So, indeed, animals are good for saying things about humans. But in many cases, animals in children's books are used to say things about children in particular. The wildness of animals and children alike, which I commented on earlier, is frequently portrayed in children's books. In Anglo-Saxon culture, Maurice Sendak's classic picture book, Where the Wild Things Are from 1963, has become a touchstone for stories about wild or feral children and their need to handle their wild animal or monstrous desires. And here we have the protagonist, Max, who dresses up in his wolf suit one night and goes berserk. Uh, and for this, he is sent to his room where he uh, later travels on to the land of the wild things to solve his inner turmoil. So the myth of the wild animal child still with us. In her book on ethics and children's literature, Claudia Mills notes that authors and illustrators use animal, toy, or other anthropomorphized characters as stand-ins for humans, allowing humor and whimsy to disguise didactic messages as fun 
while masking the protagonist's identity as a reflection of the child's own developmental foibles. Having said this, we have to acknowledge that animal is an unstable category, especially so within children's literature, where the child and the animal quite often are rather strangely conflated categories. Take a look at Dick Bruna's Miffy. I've heard papers presented uh, analyzing Bruna's Miffy books where it's never mentioned um, that the protagonist in the book is an animal, um, but constantly referred to as the child. Another favorite example is uh, these photographs you can see to the right. It's uh, um, Anne Geddes photographs. She was very popular in the 80s um, for dressing up uh, babies specifically and young children in animal suits and photographing them. Um, um, images that, hmm, that puts the uh, viewer in an awkward position because these images are both um, attractive, but also uh, disturbing, which is probably the reason to why they were so popular at the time. So there exists a strange fluidity between what we perceive as child and animal, drawing on a long held assumption that children and hence also children's literature by its very nature is associated with the primitive or uncivilized. Clearly such assumptions, such assumptions about children and animals have shaped the way children's literature looks. Perhaps the abundance of humanized animals in books for children says more about the adults who produce these texts and illustrations, and it says about their target audience, children. But in Odelman phrases this like this. It is possible that we adults have so filled the lives of children with images and stories of humanized creatures from birth onward that we have taught them to do so. Children might not imagine childishness as being animal-like if adults did not so consistently invite them to do so. Food for thought. Animal is an unstable category. And so is undoubtedly the anthropomorphic animal. But we have to remember also that humanized animals in children's books are not all alike. They appear on a sliding scale on a continuum from more to less human-like. Generalizing about this phenomenon is very tempting, but not always very helpful since a great variety exists. I found myself over the years increasingly fascinated um, by the unstable nature between human and animals in children's literature. So let's have a look at what's been said about humanized animals in children's books and the number of ways in which this very popular phenomenon can be understood and problematized. Maria Nikolaeva and Carol Scott argue in their How Picture Books Work that anthropomorphic animal characters are used extensively in picture books because they help authors and illustrators avoid depicting age, gender, and social status, um, such as class uh, or race, for example. Um, 
often you can see um, um, this quote is often referred to. Uh, but I would like to um, bring a word of caution and ask, how often is this really the case? In fact, the age of most humanized animal characters in the book is usually revealed uh, by the manner in which um, the animal relates to its surroundings, for example, within their family. Now, Peter Rabbit, as we saw earlier, Beatrix Potter's Peter Rabbit, is an archetypal naughty child that will never grow up. Babar, Jean de Brunhoff's Babar, is followed throughout uh, the picture books about him from his childhood until he grows up and assumes adult responsibility as ruling the elephants in the jungle. And if we look a little bit closer to home, uh, the Finnish picture book artist Mauri Kunmas, who's built his career on anthropomorphic um, um, Interestingly enough, he also has a background in cartoons. Gunnas um, is now not a stranger to depict his animal characters to be of a certain age. And here we can see his uh, uh, um, the Maki children in the far field. Also, very few anthropomorphic animals are in fact. A gender is usually revealed uh, in the names or by gender-specific clothing. Um, the example I've chosen among thousands, I'm sure you can think of examples, other examples yourself, is Olaf and Lena Landström's charming um, uh, sheep couple, Boo and Ba. And I just looked them up and I see they're called Buya Ba in Finnish as well. So mm. um, whether their age is a bit blurred uh, in the stories, uh, their gender is very specifically visualized in their choice of clothing. Finally, human concepts of race or ethnicity tend to be repeated, I think, in the species that most anthropomorphic animals are subjected to. Now, and I find this fascinatingly odd, the blending of species are very rare in stories, children's stories about humanized animals. As we can see in the examples here, um, sheep stick together, dogs stick together, uh, and so forth, as if the animal fantasy, which already demands a leap of faith from readers, were somehow to become too incredible if species boundaries were crossed. Now, I would on the contrary argue that anthropomorphic animals tend to be used to either reinforce age and gender stereotypes and species or to subvert them. Both possibilities are possible. To give you a few examples. Richard Scarry, uh, whose picture books are still um, published and widely read and sold, um, captures a lot of the um, oddities that I've mentioned earlier when it comes to humanized animals and picture, in, in picture books. Now look at the title of Richard Scarry's uh, book, What Do People Do All Day? Um, again, um, trying to uh, get around the fact that there's not a lot of people in his books, mainly animals. Also, uh, Richard Scarry's books, uh, which, which um, they tend uh, also to perpetuate very stereotypical gender roles. As you can see, the family 
uh, in the other picture, it's mommy who cooks breakfast and Sally who helps her. Again, age, gender, uh, everything is very clear in this, uh, um, in this picture. Uh, and of course, there is this ironical oddity here, which you can pick up on in, in uh, uh, some books featuring anthropomorphic animals, uh, pigs eating bacon for breakfast. Now, examples of subversion um, are admittedly rather unique, but the more interesting. One example is Danish Kim Fuchs Olkeson and Swedish Eva Eriksson's uh, picture book, Mannen och damen och något till magen. Um, the man and the lady and something hiding in the stomach. This is a story about a human couple expecting their first child. Everything is uh, fine until the baby is born and the new parents are shaken to their core when their baby turns out to be a monkey. The desperate parents will try anything to make their child look like other babies. As you can see, they even try to shave their offspring, uh, but with a poor result. On a symbolic level, the story captures the parents' rather shameful anxiety over how to come to terms with their child being so different from others. And here's spoiler warning, actually they do, but um, I'm not going to tell you how. You just have to get hold of the book and read it. Another favorite example where, um, where stereotypes of um, age, gender and species is subverted, um, spe especially speciesism, is German illustrator Wolf Albrook's um, Book of Love Poems. Um, the poems have ri are written by Jürg Schubiger, but uh, Ulf Albrecht, who uh, also um, is very fond of using humanized animals um, in his books, um, chooses to illustrate these love poems very rather boldly by depicting the in a mood couples in surprising ways, crossing the anxious border uh, between species. As these examples show, anthropomorphic animals do in fact often comment on matters of age, gender, race, and social status. But again, it can be done both to either reinforce or to subvert stereotypes, perhaps less often um, to subvert stereotypes. In his essay on animal stories, Simon Flynn makes a strong case for the dual appeal of animal stories for children in that they encourage a combination of distancing and empathy. Hence, telling a story through anthropomorphic animals can provide an emotional distance when dealing with troubling subject matters in books for children. And this is often cited as one of the causes to the huge popularity of anthropomorphic animals, in especially picture books for younger readers. Now, the downside of this phenomenon is that the picture book market today is literally flooded with mass produced animal stories in which humanized bears, bunnies or badgers, often these animals tend to be a lot on the cuter side, uh, suffer strictly human growing pains. This book, these books, uh, which seem to exist in a loop that feeds itself, exploit animals as mere stand-in figures for human beings and thereby erasing all their animalness. 
Now, the examples I've chosen here are actually Swedish translations of English books. Um, um, the one to the left is a story about two friends, a bear, bear and a rabbit, who, um, who learn how to say, I'm sorry, to apologize to each other. And the other one is a story about a small bunny who eventually manages to give up his security blanket. Um, as you can see, um, these animals haven't much of their animal traits um, um, have been erased. Um, even in such a fashion that the small rabbit who's going to give up his or her security blanket ends up giving it to fox cub uh, and the sense of certain animals being natural enemies aren't part of this idyllic world where uh, these animals perhaps resemble uh, sort of animated toys rather than actual uh, animals. However, again, a word of caution. There are also picture book artists who dare take greater chances with the human animal metaphor and use it to stage human dramas where much more is at stake, as in these books. In, for example, Crystal Rems' uh, picture book Padlemo, I think this is also published in Finnish. Um, I was supposed to check that, but I've got. <laughs> Humanized animals are part of a topsy-turvy adoption story that subverts racial stereotypes. Here, a childless elephant couple has to undergo a long and strenuous journey from their home south. They travel up north in order to find an orphaned baby elephant to bring home with them. An even perhaps more radical example is Norwegian Grudale and Sven Nyhus, uh, who are famous for handling sensitive subjects in their picture books. Um, their picture book Aquarium, uh, Aquarium tells the story of a young girl who lacks adult support at home and has to shoulder too much responsibility at too early an age. Now this girl's mother's inability to act as a grown up caretaker is very vividly captured in her being a mute fish trapped in her aquarium, unable to communicate with or care for her daughter. Now these picture books that I've mentioned here last um, make interesting use of anthropomorphic animals to address symbolically very complex human issues in imaginative ways, in artistic ways. Still, it has to be said that the phenomenon of, of humanized animals is, pro, uh, is profoundly anthropocentric at heart. These stories do not invite readers to see the animal, but rather the human hiding behind the animal. Anthropomorphic animals are seldom, if ever, allowed to represent the animal per se. They are used to serve human purposes, to tell stories of humankind. At the core of anthropomorphism lies the humanist assumption that animals are non-human others. And Western humanist philosophy has a long tradition of anthropocentrism, which is not to be mixed up with anthropo anthropomorphism. Anthropocentrism, which means that we as human have a tendency, a very strong tendency to perceive animals as non-human others. The wild and instinctual animal is understood to be in binary opposition to civilized and rational humankind, perhaps with the exception, of course, of children, which I talked about before, as we've seen. Now, anthropocentrism carries, in fact, an inherent bias towards human beings as somehow superior 
to non-human entities. So if mankind has shown a certain predilection for mirroring itself in animal images and the metaphorical uses that animal representations are put to, um, and the metaphorical uses that animal representations are put to, they often reflect a power imbalance um, in human-animal relations. It is ironical, but often pointed out that in modern times, when humans, including children, have become increasingly estranged from animals, living in urban environments and losing the connection to nature, animals have become increasingly visible metaphors in their lives. For example, endangered animals have become cute and cuddly soft toys. Exotic animals star in blockbuster animations where they are endowed with such superpowers or otherwise human characteristics that they lose most of their animalness. Now, due to the power imbalance that exists in human animal relations. The manner in which we depict animals in children's books have ethical implications. So, how do we deal with the fact that animals are both ideas as well as living and breathing creatures? Shouldn't they be allowed to be represented as themselves? Today, animal studies, ecocriticism, and posthumanism, specifically critical posthumanism, have provided us with theoretical tools for better understanding and grappling with anthropomorphic animal characters. How can we counteract our anthropocentric bias? That is our human-centered bias that has been dinned into us culturally from earliest childhood and embrace a more ecocentric day, way of viewing the world we live in, where mankind is seen as equal to and depending on all other living species, not superior to it. Donna Haraway, who is a key figure in animal studies, speaks of humans and animals as potential companion species, which she explains as a desire for becoming with the animal, since we cannot think about the one without the other. And Haraway argues that humanity co-evolves with other species, shares space with them, and hence ought to offer an ethical relation to their fellow species. Now, in fact, animals and humans, as a form of companion species, already has a rather long tradition within children's literature. In 2015, two uh, important studies uh, um, claiming this uh, were published. It's Zoe Jack's Children's Literature and the Post-Human, which also not only deals with animals, but uh, uh, um, with other uh, features as well, and Amy Rattel's Animality and Children's Literature and Film. Now, Zoe Jack claims, among other things, that children's fiction often permits not only the pleasures of topsy-turvy play, but a complication and interrogation of the binary ontologies and hierarchical divisions by which the world is constructed and inscribed. And Amy Rattel says that literature geared towards a child audience present the boundary between humans and animals as at best permeable and in a state of continual flux. Now, posthumanism argues for the breakdown of boundaries between human and non human, nature and culture, wild and domesticated.
And eco-critical literature is written within the Anthropocene where human beings aren't at the center. Carrie Mallon puts this very adequately when she says that as a human enterprise, children's literature cannot abandon its anthropocentric basis, but it can take on an ecocritic perspective that invites readers to think about their world and all that is part of that world, human and non-human, and a ways of being in the world. Um, an obvious example of this, at least in my opinion, is Timo Kontios and Elina Varsta's picture book trilogy about uh, a dog called Cat, Koira Nimeltan Kissa, where there exists a very close and uh, equal relationship between um, a man and a dog uh, who coexist. Uh, but speciesism is also interrogated um, since, as the title says, the dog in the story actually wishes that he were a cat. I'm sure you can also think of other examples of children's books where a um, more equal relationship between child and animal is portrayed. One obvious example is Astrid Lindgren and her entire um, um, authorship uh, and the way that she um, made animal activism um, um, and her struggle for animal rights part of her uh, stories um, where um, animals feature as equal companions um, I'm, I'm thinking especially uh, of in, in Lönnebergia, for example. Another example, uh, a favorite example of mine is again Wolf Albrook's picture book about Mrs. Meyer, um, who happens to stumble upon a, a fledgling, a small bird that has fallen out of its nest and been abandoned. And she takes up the challenge to teach this bird how to fly with rather surprising um, consequences. Uh, surprising and liberating consequences for her as well. I'd like to finally round up with two recent children's books um, that imagine other ways of being in the world and challenging anthropomorphism and our uh, anthropocentric bias. The first of them is Linda Bundestam's Mit, picture book Mit Botten Lieb, of an ensam axolotl, also published in Finnish as Elämäni Pohjalla, it was published in 2020. Um, this picture book tells the story about a tiny um, axolotl, a tiny animal facing extinction. Um, the uh, hero of this story lives all alone at the bottom of a lake, uh, where he finds himself becoming increasingly lonely. He is, after all, becoming extinct. On land, the axolot witnesses human beings enjoying themselves uh, very short-sightedly for the day, consuming and littering and um, not thinking much about um, uh, their environment. Finally, a tidal wave comes and washes everything away. And the axolotl is thrown out into the world um, 
where he eventually finds companionship, love, and a future. What happens to humankind is, however, not revealed in the story. Bundestam's sort of strange mix of happy catastrophe adventure clearly undermines, I'd say, an anthropocentric view of the fragile world we live in. Here, humans are firmly set and positioned in the margin. The point of view is animal, albeit anthropomorphized. The approach is quite radical, in fact, and invites many different readings. You can read this as a um, happy adventure, if you read it from the point of view of the axolotl. Uh, he manages to find um, love and a future. For humankind, not so happy. The book provides no solutions, and why should it? We haven't figured out any solutions to the problem yet, have we? But um, it does, in a very clever way, I think, turn the reader's eye away from an anthropocentric way of thinking about human existence on the world, putting humans in the margin and showing us the vulnerability of the planet as such um, and um, the way that humans exist together with other species and as part of life on Earth. And it has consequences. The other example I have to finish off with is French author and most recent Alma laureate, Jean-Claude Mugleva and his children's novel, Jefferson which has been translated into Swedish, recently, um, and I hope it will be translated into Finnish soon, which also, uh, or not also, but which do address the power imbalance in human-animal relations heads on and very bravely. It is a comic murder mystery where the charming anti-hero Jefferson, who you can see here on the um, 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 on the book, um, Jefferson uh, uh, is, as you can all see, a hedgehog um, and not the bravest of characters, but he loves adventure stories. The problem is that one day he finds himself being framed for murder. He goes to the uh, barber to have his, I don't know, um, to touch up his, um, um, his, I was going to say haircut, but that doesn't work. Anyway, and he finds his barber murder, brutally murdered and standing by the body, he is accused of that murder. Now, in order to prove his innocence, he has to travel to the neighboring land of humans. And Morlevat very clearly and cleverly lets the two worlds, which seldom meet in children's literature, collide. In Jefferson's world, anthropomorphic animals are valued as individual subjects in their own right. But in the world of humans, non-speaking animals are either domesticated pets or enslaved within a meat industry that treats them as unfeeling objects only useful as food. Now Jefferson is an engrossing novel. It is entertaining, suspenseful and funny, but in the subtext, the author urges readers to rethink the power imbalance in human animal relationships and our own anthropocentric bias as human beings. The book proposes that species is in fact a form, form of racism in which some forms of life are consigned to the margins to be exploited, ignored or eliminated. It doesn't do it with a big finger in your face, 
but it is there in the text and in the story. And I think that both uh, Linda Wunderstam's and Jean-Claude Morlevas uh, novels and uh, respectively picture book show the way forward, um, how it is possible to see the animal differently also in children's fiction, where we are so used to seeing animals, but without actually seeing them as animals. For this, empathy is a key element. These stories express a desire for a more equal relationship between men and animals, as well as the enchantment of iron and environmental awareness and a celebration of liberating fantasy over materialism. So, to sum up, in children's literature, the borders between human and animal are as unstable as they are elsewhere. And as I hope I have showed you, Anthropomorphic or humanized animals can be used for a variety of purpose, purposes. Some animal stories do attempt to bridge the gap between humans and animals by allowing us to imagine our connectedness instead of our separatedness. And they may do so more or less successfully. So, what I want you to take with you from this lecture and keep in mind the next time you read a book with anthropomorphic animals is not to jump to preconceived conclusions about who or what these characters represent. Instead, Take a step back, study the phenomenon carefully, and ask yourselves. These anthropomorphic animals, where do they exist on the human animal continuum? How human are they? How animal are they? And what are the implications of this? Do these animal characters reinforce, or do they in fact trouble binary distinctions between human and animal? Do they reinforce or subvert stereotypes of age, gender, and ethnicity or race? Do they invite closeness and empathy or do they invite psychological distance to the matters and issues handled in that story? And if so, again, what are the implications? And finally, do the anthropomorphic animals envision a kind of human animal connectedness, an ecocentric point of view, or do they reinforce the human animal distinction that lies, unfortunately, so close at heart to us human beings and expressing an anthropocentric point of view. Because what I found when looking at animals in picture books, they are seldom what they seem to be at first glance. And they deserve our thorough inspection and analysis. And also, in particular, they deserve to be analyzed in a manner that take the ethical implications into consideration as well. And with that, I say thank you very much. <laughs>